Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul with RP1 series in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1 and in this episode we will begin with another attempt with the Lunar Lander A except this time I'll try and make sure that we're attempting to land on the side of the moon that is facing Earth and also I've replaced the RCS thrusters with a 1 kN thruster so it'll be a little bit quicker to decelerate so the timing will not be so bad. Um, altogether the upper stages have 3300 to attempt to burn off all of the excess velocity, which, you know, in theory is enough, but it's gonna still take some effort. And that's all right. I mean, when you think about the surveyor probes, I think like three out of six of them actually worked, which is America's attempt to land on the moon and the Soviet efforts were not exactly flawless either. So, you know, and actually we're ahead of time, uh, ahead of schedule on that. You know, it's March 3rd, 1964, we're early. Uh, this is the only thing we're early on. We haven't sent anybody to space. We haven't uh, sent uh, probes to Venus or Mars, really. Uh, I mean, we, I think we accidentally have an interplanetary probe. But uh, yeah, so, you know, at least we have one thing that we're going to potentially beat uh, reality on. Um, anyway, uh, on another note, uh, I, it occurred to me, uh, the, somebody asked me a question about the rollout costs during my live stream, and it occurred to me that people don't understand. I am very well aware that the rollout costs bundle in assembly, um, what you got, integration, and all of that. Um, the The issue is the way it's being calculated, and especially the fact that it's a per rocket basis versus a monthly basis, because what that cost is isn't a rollout cost. What that cost is is the labor cost. And I would like that to be reflected more properly and simpler. I mean, it's, it, it'll simplify it a lot if it's recognized as a labor cost, which needs to be applied monthly, which is already possible in RP1. We already have monthly costs, like if I actually had uh, Kerbinauts, or, uh, you know, we have facility costs that are applied uh, regularly um, per year, per month. You can have, see the costs. We just we just need the... the um, labor costs to be applied the same way because we have this workforce and the workforce can be determined not by the launch pad. The launch pad, shouldn't, uh, the launch pad size shouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, launch pad cost is a single cost and then there's a maintenance cost on like the crawler and the pad itself and that's that's all under maintenance here already and so um, the, the labor costs the rollout cost should be dependent on the pad. What they should be dependent on is the build points which represents, you know, build points are dependent on labor. You can only build something fast if you have people to do it. And the faster you build something, the more people you need. Now, that gets to another sort of inadequacy of this uh, situation economically in that we can't reduce our build points. So we have ever increasing, and that's why they've done it sort of this way, they've sort of disambiguated this rollout cost thing, because you keep adding build points, which means you can never reduce costs. And that's not how it works, of course, if uh, you just keep adding build points, NASA would build an SLS in a week. Um, <laughs> but they've never matched their build points per second that they had in the 1960s. Uh, they had to reduce their, la uh, their labor costs, they had to reduce how many people they had. So, um, if, if I, I hate to point out problems and not propose a solution. So here's my solution, if I could code it. I can't code it. Um, I'm, I, I've been spending my time with uh, 3D modeling and uh, trying to figure out other stuff. Uh, coding plugins for KSB I have not unfortunately spent time on. But basically I imagine a little box right here and there's, there's a number of workers and there's a number of scientists and there's a right arrow and a left arrow. So you can increase and decrease the workers and increase and decrease the scientists. And it tells you right at the bottom below the number of workers and scientists how much they cost per month. And that will let you increase your build points per second and also your research per second. And the actual upgrade point system will be eliminated. And you can, the amount of build points per worker and amount of science per scientist will depend on unlocking technology. So you can increase the efficiency of your workers and scientists by unlocking certain technologies like the equivalent of advanced construction would improve the efficiency of workers. And you can therefore increase your build rate like that. 
But, and uh, that would, uh, you know, without actually increasing the number of workers, you can just invest in those technologies. Um, if you want to rush build something, it won't be like this. You will just hire more workers. So the rush build button would go away. And, and then, and the rollout costs will go away because the ro uh, how fast you roll something out, how fast you build something, all those costs, the labor costs will be literally labor costs. And the costs of the parts in the VAB that you see will be the part costs, the material costs, the uh, cost to get that engine from its manufacturer or something like that. So that, that would be how I do it. Um, now, is that the way they want to do it? I don't know. But it solves a bunch of obvious problems. Like with the rollout cost right now, it's not worthwhile. Ba basically, it's saying that reusability is useless because with reusability, you can only get the part, ca uh, part costs back. But if the rollout costs are four times the part costs, the economics of it are horrible. Um, if you have a fixed cost, uh, based a monthly cost for your labor, then retrieving the boosters it still saves you some money. I mean, it saves you the part cost, plus it saves you some cost in building the thing. Um, you, you probably need to spend a little bit of money for retrieval, but that's sort of built into the fact that when you retrieve it, you do not get the full value of the parts back. So, you know, I mean, it's just thinking about how to implement it is a complicated matter. And, um, you know, I appreciate the attempt and I just have a few minor grievances with the implementation. Uh, so, but I do understand what they were trying to go for. Um, it's just that I think it should, it's just a personal thing that should be done differently. And I wish I could just do it for myself. I mean, I don't want to bother anybody about it. Uh, I wish I could just write the plugin. <laughs> I mean, uh, I really do. Uh, so I also wish I could write a plugin for procedural engines, um, which would also have engine testing and you could design your own engine and do stuff like that. That, you know, that, that was the thing that I've been wanting to do for quite a while. But I'm going to have to invest some time in learning how to write plugins for Kerbal Space Program and I'm focused on other things right now. So, yeah. Anyway. Uh, not to make a big deal of it, but it does get brought up in the comments as well. Um, this is this is my problem in a nutshell. And um, yeah, let's get on with actually trying to do things. I We're unlocking 1960 orbital rocketry here. And I think we could probably upgrade the RD-0105 and turn it into a RD-0109 uh, with that technology. So... Maybe I should edit that, bring it in, and see how that works out. Maybe it'll give us a little bit more margin. Okay, as it so happens, we have brought it out to the launch pad at just the right time. Relative inclination is very low. Uh, throttle up, SAS is on, and ignition. And launch. Uh, the RD-0105 is now an RD-0109 with better ISP. We're carrying a bit more hydrazine in order to adjust our orbit on that particular stage for more fine-tuning. Okay, separation. Okay, they have separated cleanly. Well, at least they didn't hit us. They experienced some other stresses. Okay, booster engine set. Okay, all is well. Guess we should monitor our inclination a bit. Yeah, we need to turn a little bit further south. Okay, and shut down. 201 by 144 as tight as it gets on this side of it. 0 0.31 degree inclination with the moon and separation. RCS forward, uh, fairing separation and activate solar panels. Excellent. Okay, uh, we are ready to plot for the moon.
Okay, well, I might be wrong, but I believe this will be a good initial approach. I hope I've got it right this time. And yeah, uh, the thing is hitting it as part of the burn. Uh, our stage does 3,242 meters per second, so might want to throw in something uh, useless to just sop up the extra delta V. Okay, so that's sort of a grazing path there, uh, arriving in four days, and it takes 3,242, and we've got 3,242, though. Actually, we'll end up having a little bit more than that because we're going to use some RCS while turning, and that'll lighten it up for the engine. But uh, good enough for now. We're facing the wrong way as far as power is concerned, though. So let's just go... Orbit Retrograde RCS. And we really hope the Atlas stage doesn't hit us. Okay, when we time warp, we are recharging. Good. And we have to wait an hour. Wait till we get the RD-58, which is much more efficient and has multiple ignitions. That will be good times. Okay, throttling up. And ignition. And it failed. Wait. The main engine failed, but the verniers didn't. Now here's an interesting thing. The verniers actually have better efficiency than the main engine, but it doesn't do us any good. It doesn't do us any good. Well, that's a first. Uh, it's not accumulating data units. The, I guess the verniers don't count. Well, that got me back. All those times it just didn't ignite the verniers. Finally got me back for those. They don't have much thrust at all. 0.8 kilonewtons. Eh, it's not going to work out for us. Even though they have nice uh, specific impulse, it'll be like trying to cycle out with an ion thruster. So, uh, we'll just uh, dispose of this, I think. There's no, no avoiding that necessity. So, retrograde, please. I mean, do we have enough fuel to fly by the moon? Yes, with the upper stages we could do a lunar flyby, but we don't have any contract for that. Nor are we carrying any special instrument. You know, it occurs to me we're going to have a very awkward situation when we try to land on the moon with that one kilonewton thrust. We're, we are going to end up tilting. Maybe I should lower these fuel containers. As far as technologies we're going to unlock, human rated EDL is coming up, crew survivability. But as far as stuff that could help out this mission, we really aren't looking at anything there. We do have some science. I mean, if we could find some technology that would help this. Uh, specifically, an upgrade to the RCS thrusters, maybe. Alright, well, that should do the trick. Hopefully that'll automatically dispose of it. Alright, uh, to the R&D building. Well, you see, I had this clever plan. I had this plan where we would unlock basic capsules and then go for the requirement for second generation capsules, which was advanced capsules era materials research. And uh, those combined, this one, this one, and this one would take up all our science. But maybe, maybe beating the Soviets and the Americans to landing on the moon would probably be a better thing. Let me double check on the Soviets. What was the date for Luna 9? That's the soft landing on the moon. Okay, so first soft landing on the moon, 1966, January 31st. So we have plenty of time. We have plenty of time. I I feel like the thing to do is to get... I, 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 I mean, we have these thrusters, so it must be an upgrade to the thrusters. I really hope this technology is an upgrade to our thrusters. We've got... Uh, Kavia B is pretty good, I thought. So that's an interesting thing. I didn't realize it was that early on. Um... So yeah, maybe this will give us an upgrade to the one kilonewton thruster in particular. That would be nice. 
but it's uh, toss up. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that that's what it does. Our uh, tech level two for hydrazine is what I'm talking about. But all right, we can do that. Uh, another cur curious thing is AJ10 mid range. Um, that should have yeah. This is the unlimited ignition one right here. So this one doesn't really make it clear how many ignitions this uh, maybe this is the only configuration on it okay so yeah that would be nice still we would have a reliability thing and a maximum burn time the 400 seconds is a lot better than the two minutes for the early one and oh there's another configuration here for 300 seconds so this is the 300 second one and i guess this is the 400 second one but I don't know how many ignitions this one has. Maybe unlimited. So that's tempting. Uh, the H1 is currently really, really cheap. Surprisingly cheap, really. It does help to be balanced with the NK engines, which are um, formidable in their prowess. Uh, we don't get those until here. But these, and then the these other ones uh, where is the NK 15 anyway well wow, it's pretty far down here huh okay I don't know I would I mean they were first used in 1969 but they must have been developed earlier anyway uh, 770 I, I imagine that the H1 should be a little bit closer to the 770 than it is right now seems a little bit too good to be true at this price if you know what I mean so there's that but then I was just talking about the RD58, and the RD58 has five ignitions, um, great thrust, 338 second ISP upgradable to more than that. Uh, down the line, we get a 356 over here and a 361 here, 362 even, and 15 ignitions. So these are very nice. That's when it gets put on the Buran and uses Sintin. Uh, which is a variant of kerosene that's a little bit more efficient. The burn times for most of the variants are very nice. Um, starts out a little bit weak, I think. Um, this 4 minutes and 10 seconds, but uh, currently our RD0105-09 gets 7 minutes and 20 seconds, so that's good, but we never use it for that long. So maybe, okay, I'll, I'll queue up basic capsules. We should be aiming to do that. So we'll have the basic capsules. We're getting this stability thing. Um, and I'm tempted to just get these two. I think we ought to. Uh, science might be a very important thing too. But we don't have enough for uh, these. These aren't that great. Those aren't that great. Upgrades to procedural avionics might be necessary eventually. But yeah, let's plunge ahead here. Oh, as people want solid rockets, not really. They're not very good. They just aren't very economically good. You don't uh, get even halfway decent ones until... Uh, no, not the Minute Man. Oh, I'm surprised we get these. So Well, I mean, it makes sense, sort of. But the casters was what I was looking for. Casters are interesting. The UA-1205s, it depends on the pricing. I'll have to look at that. The trouble for the UA-1205s now, believe it or not, is from... Oh, there's the RL-10. Uh, is from the H1. Uh, the H1... I mean, you, you could lose a few of these, but... 255, 289, they're really tight. They're really dense little engines that you can cluster a lot of on a booster. And you, uh, since they're 200 apiece, you can cluster four of them on a booster. Uh, you get, oh, nearly 4,000 uh, kilonewtons uh, in vacuum. And they're 800. Now, the fuel isn't going to cost that much. It really depends on the tanks. But then you take a look at the UA-1205, well, this is 3,702. Uh, it gives you, let's say, 6,000 kilonewtons. So let's say six of these. Well, six of the H1s, you still get, you know, $1,200, $1,200. And the tank is just not going to cost that much. The fuel isn't going to cost that much either. 
Uh, so the dry mass of this is... Uh, the mass of the fuel is 192, uh, the mass of the booster is 226, so the dry mass is 30, um, 34 tons, uh, a little bit less than 34 tons. So that's 34 tons. I don't know how much the, tanks, the tank has gone away with this, but the engines, six of them, would be 3.6 tons. The tank is, I mean, maybe it'll be more than 30 tons, but I doubt it. So, yeah, that's an interesting situation. It's an interesting, and these could burn for longer too, potentially. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about solid rocket motors. It's, it's not that I, I, I have a religion about them. It's just that when you do the math, the casters, you can see why I, I sort of like them. They're, they're relatively cheap. I mean, they don't give a whole lot of thrust, but I can sort of justify using them as, uh, strap-on booster to for special payloads and eventually caster fours and the gems that come along the ones that are actually used these guys though hmm i don't know we'll see we'll see how uh, the math turns out uh of course we'll have to upgrade our pad because currently our pad limitation is 150 tons which means we can't even use this on its own so yeah I'm going to toss my upgrade points into R&D since we've got so many technologies to research and I'll even uh, buy a few more points for that, but I'll take that much risk. All right, let's see. So the rocket is basically the same as last time, except the, the arrangement with the one kilonewton thruster is a little bit better for landing. And uh, we could have upgraded the core engines on the Atlas, uh, both the LR-89s and the LR-105s, but that would have cost money. And I don't see a reason right now, because we really can't make our payload any heavier because of the burn time. So we could make the one kilonewton thruster bit. No, I mean, the because the, it's dependent on the avionics with the, uh, the Pioneer core plus the little avionics core that we have with it. So it has to be 0.2 uh, tons. And then the Araby is going to burn for a minute and five seconds no matter what, so we can't really in increase its size. And then the RD-0109 is just supposed to have enough delta V to get us to the moon, so we can't really increase its size. It only has one ignition. We can't use it to make orbit around the moon. So we're basically stuck. Uh, we don't really need an engine upgrade at this point for this mission. Okay, here we go again. Throttle up. SAS is on. Uh, we're reasonably aligned with the moon. Ignition. And launch. I swear if the RD-0109 has a problem again, I'm going right back to the RD-0105. Okay, booster set. And they get ripped apart. Okay, booster engine set. Okay, getting ready for shutdown. And shutdown. 222 by 140. Again, really close. And we're actually on the way down here. But uh, anyway, still good. 324 meters per second left, nominal burn, and separation. Okay, another CS on. Okay, whatever, we're going full suicide burn into right, right here. Now, will that be facing the Earth by the time we get to it? Which is all the way over here? Hmm, I don't know. But I also want to be in sunlight, so that's the rub. We'll we'll plot this for now. Hopefully we'll have enough RCS fuel to fix it a little bit and to make course adjustment if it looks like it's going the wrong way. Okay, throttle up. And ignition. Okay, looks good. We have it this time. There goes the Atlas booster. Seems like our timing is good.
Might be a second off. Oh, that was early. Okay, where are we? I think the RCS can handle the rest, which probably is for the best, actually. Okay, so I'm gonna aim the smack into the moon like that. Um, about like that. And we'll see once we get closer whether we are still in sort of a communication situation with Earth. But for now this will do. Let's make sure we are going to be powered once we get into daylight. That seems like a fair orientation, so we'll just hold that. Okay, so we will be coming in here. And sort of, sort of borderline, sort of borderline on on everything. I guess, I mean, we have to pick communication over sunlight. So let me see. The probe should operate for a decent amount of time anyway. As far as the fuel we're using, it's up here. Still got 50 units. Basically, this extra fuel we've got here was the net benefit of upgrading the make this engine to uh, RD0109 allowed us to carry more of this fuel. Okay, we are now headed in. Uh, communication should be good. Uh, power is more of a question. We'll bring up landing guidance. It should have a read on the situation now since we have a negative periapsis and everything. Oceanus Procellarum. Well, I've, uh, I've sort of been there before, so that's good. And we're looking at that time to land versus our stage times. Altogether, our burn time is 4 minutes and 40 seconds. Now, we probably don't want to start at 4 minutes and 40 seconds from our time to land because we're going to be slowing down. So in a minute and five seconds, we're going to burn off 1,841 meters per second. So we can hang our hat on that at least. Let's just check this engine and stage right when we decouple, since we can have the thrusters running right now. Okay, it looks very stable. Separation. Let's try that again. Okay, we seem to have ignition. It might be too early. After this, we have 1,500 meters per second to work with. The question is whether the moon wants to pull us down faster than that. Okay. Uh, throwing down and checking decoupling. Yes, separation. Right. Okay, we have a suicide burn countdown there of 3 minutes and 35 seconds. And it is counting down 3 minutes and 34 seconds of stage time. Okay, well, at least we can see the surface now, thankfully. Some ambient light has occurred. Still a suicide burn countdown of 54 seconds and counting down. Since we have infinite ignitions, I'll try and make sure not to have a suicide burn countdown more than 10 seconds. I, I think that's a good idea. And then I'll turn it on every time it reaches 2 seconds. Try and kill horizontal velocity. Not that it really matters whether we tip over as long as we make a soft landing. Okay. Must not go up. Oh, oh we, we, we bounced a bit. Okay, 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 okay. It's alright, it's alright, it's alright. You can turn off now. Oh, well, we're rocking a bit. We're rocking. So, my 
placement of the tanks wasn't quite right. But 400 meters per second to spare, that's pretty good. All right, does it read, we have landed, now we have to transmit science. It looks like we can do that. I didn't realize this had this little electric charge. We dumped some electric charge along the way. Okay, so analyze telemetry. Transmit. Log radiation. 36 science. Transmit. Okay, magnetic scan. 10 science, but okay. And mass spectrometry. Being careful not to press range safety. Nine science. Okay, hopefully we got all that. Well, it looks a lot higher than it used to. And we got our contract fulfilled. Yep, well, that saves us a lot of trouble. All right, back to Space Center. Well, given that success, we really don't need to rush on the staged combustion orbital rocketry or anything. Uh, the staged combustion for the RD-58 and over rocketry, mainly for the AJ-10. Uh, let's focus on, focus on the crew stuff. Let's get the basic capsules done and everything. And uh, maybe, well, I guess we have to do lunar range communication before interplanetary communication. We've got the Pioneer 5, which is might, might help with the whole interplanetary mission thing if you want to. When is the next window to Mars? Or Venus? Mars first in 212 days. We could try and toss something. I mean, we could keep it cheap, you know, um, shooting for the moon, if you will. Um, a pie in the sky attempt. So yeah, maybe, uh, but perhaps we should finally send a Kerbal into space. Uh, do we have available contracts here? A lot of sounding rocket stuff still. Past the comm online is the thing. Obviously, we hope to break the sound bar barrier along the way. Orbital flight. Wow, that's pretty lucrative. Oh, they want they, they don't mind getting another lunar landing out of us. Maybe we should do that now that we've got a system that seems to work. I mean, of course, an engine could fail, but within a year we could do it. Lunar landing and sample return is a little bit beyond us, given the fact that we have the 150 ton limit on our pad right now. And we'll keep it to that as long as I've got stuff to do that can be satisfied with that. And frankly, the, the what you got, uh, pass to comm online is easy. Even orbital flight can be done with it. And uh, Mars flyby and Venus flyby can certainly be done with uh, Atlas rocket. So yeah, those are in two years. Those will hang out, I expect, even though it says expires in a day and five hours. So maybe we can look to attempt that despite the fact that we don't have interplanetary communications. Does it say that we have to transmit data? Missed that. Yeah, we have to transmit science data. So it doesn't count just if we happen to toss it there and lose communication. Uh, we did get some, some science points and I know what I'm looking for. I'm looking to eventually get second generation capsules there. Doing the another lunar landing mission would be worthwhile just for the science. And what we want is this advanced capsules era materials so that we can eventually unlock that. So uh, we'll just queue that up as well. But we've got a lot, a lot of sciences just waiting on us right now. Okay, so we'll take this additional lunar landing contract. It seems like a good thing to do just for the science. So we'll do that. Uh, but I, I don't know if... Well, certainly we should look to do more than that next time, because otherwise it'd be a duplicate of this episode, which would not be sufficient. So, on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.